Well, this painting by a Delhi artist of the time, Ghulam Ali Khan, is of eight soldiers of the Gurkha Army of Nepal in 1814, an army that was to challenge the supremacy of the Honorable East India Company, that by the 1800s had extended its venture capitalism and power throughout much of India. You may see the cookery tucked into the cummerbund for 200 years, a distinctive and lethal feature of the Gurkha soldier. 200 years later, and here is another picture of eight contemporary Gurkhas, men of the Royal Gurkha Rifles, clad in all the paraphernalia of modern warfare, still culturally intact, no longer a remnant of Raj, but deeply embedded in the van of the British Army. They are in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, and about to face the Taliban. This is the fourth occasion in the last 200 years that Gurkha riflemen have soldiered on behalf of the British Crown in that beautiful, dangerous, and perfidious country, always at some cost, at best only for some very modest gain. These two pictures, through the prism of my own regiment and service, form the brackets of my narrative. My modest place in this story began on the 2nd of June 1953 on the occasion of that last great imperial flourish, the coronation of the Queen. And as a 13-year-old I had watched the procession with my father and as the various contingents came by I noticed a company of soldiers that seemed rather different. They were dressed in dark green, they were short and stocky in stature and they carried their rifles at the trail and not at the shoulder and they seemed to raise a special cheer from the crowd. My father told me they were British Army Gurkhas, they came from Nepal, and they were very formidable soldiers. And coinciding with that parade and demonstrating almost exquisite imperial timing, or at least timing as decreed by the editor of the Times, <laughs> arrived news that Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing had reached the summit of unconquered Everest in the Nepal Himalaya. There seemed to be a clear connection between these two events. I was much taken with all of this and seven years later in 1960 I was commissioned into the richly titled Second King Edward VII's own Gurkha Rifles and I joined them in tropical Malaya. My regiment was one of four, each of two battalions that had transferred into British service at the time of the independence of India in 1947, while six other regiments had remained with the Indian Army. The second Gurkha Rifles was the oldest regiment in the Gurkha Brigade. We were apparently regarded by everyone else as rather smart, extremely idle, but militarily very effective. The other regiments were the 6 Gurkhas, who we thought rather heavy, the 7th who were unshaven, and the 10th Gurkha Rifles who seemed decidedly alcoholic. <laughs> of course it was all rubbish, or most of it was, and each regiment had very fine fighting records. My battalion of 750 men was very experienced. Many long service officers and men had several medals. They were veterans of El Alamein and Monte Cassino. Others had fought in Burma. And for the last 12 years they had campaigned continuously in the Malayan jungle against Chinese communist terrorists. The victorious end of that campaign had been celebrated only weeks before I arrived. The regiment 
had been continuously on operations for over 20 years and it all made me feel rather humble and inadequate. Not least, I was the only man in the whole battalion without a medal. The riflemen, sturdy hillmen of Mongolian appearance, were very polite and shook my hand and grinned and saluted, but that was about it, as few had much English and all battalion business was conducted in Gurkhali. And I was impressed by the easy way my fellow British officers communicated with their soldiers in their own language. There seemed to be a close fraternity amongst all ranks, an endless banter. It was a large family into which I had not yet earned my place. Everybody seemed to know exactly what to do, and no one seemed to shout at anyone. Indeed, after all the Gurkha tales of daring do that I'd heard, the riflemen, while obviously tough, seemed surprisingly non-belligerent and full of mild-mannered charm. So I set about learning the language and how you were expected to do things, and the history of the regiment that had been raised by one Lieutenant Frederick Young of the Bengal Army in 1815. I made my first tentative entry into the jungle, where the Gurkha soldier had made his name in Burma and Malaya, slithering and sliding and tripping over vines and creepers in that rotting vegetation, while the soldiers, ever tolerant of the poverty of my performance, seemed to dance lightly from log to log, avoiding every hazard. After a year, I was sent to Nepal, sandwiched between the great powers of India and China, to learn something of my soldiers' homeland and culture. Nepal extends for about 550 miles or so east to west along the line of the Himalayas and about 100 miles north to south. Along the southern border with India at about sea level runs the Terai, some 30 miles or so in depth, a flat area of cultivation of great rivers carrying the snow waters down from the Himalayas to the plains of India, of sal forest and elephant grass, modest townships, swampy and malarial in the summer months, and inhabited by people more Indian than Mongolian in caste and character. There are tigers here. Beyond the Terai rise sharply the foothills of the Himalayas running up in great ridges to the snows and inhabited to about 8,000 feet. The hills where possible are intensely cultivated and terraced. This is the country of the Gurkha soldier. Their villages are connected by a network of switchback paths and frightening bridges. And beyond the hills are the Himalayas of Annapurna and Dalagiri and Everest and many others. And in contrast, in a great bowl, is the valley of Kathmandu, where lie the furthest dreams of Kew, the vigorous cultural and administrative capital of Nepal, home today to a shaky Republican democracy and far distant and ethnically different from the hills. Here, they say, are more temples and houses, more idols and people, and much of it badly damaged in the recent earthquake. For a month, I trekked through the hills, visiting our pensioned soldiers. Fifty-five years ago, there were no roads west of Kathmandu, and I was reliant on my feet. Up and down I travelled. It was clear to me that being a yeoman farmer in the hills of Nepal bred a tough and resilient people. The proud young men attracted to military service by tradition and heritage, a chance to break away from unremitting hard labour, for travel and adventure, and in a country which has no state benefits or welfare, 
to earn funds to remit home and a pension to raise themselves and their families up the prosperity scale and to achieve the honourable status of a Gurkha soldier. I climbed up to the small town of Gorka and its fort, west of Kathmandu, the epicentre of last year's earthquake, but where in the mid-18th century the ambitious Rajput prince of the province of Gorka Prithi Narayan Shah had raised an army from among the Gorkha hill people and conquered Kathmandu and eventually achieved mastery over the whole of Nepal. And it was his successes whose territorial ambitions were to bring Nepal into conflict with the East India Company. By 1814 they had occupied lands that lay within the purview of the company as I try to show on this map. In the east they extended to Sikkim and Darjeeling, to the west into Garwal and Kuman, as well as com company territory to the south. There was a collision of interests and skirmishes and on the 1st of November the East India Company declared war on Nepal the company assembled a formidable force from its Bengal army. 30,000 regular troops, 60 guns, 12,000 auxiliaries. Logistics included 1,100 elephants, 3,600 camels. Thousands of camp followers swelled the numbers further. The wonder is not that it moved slowly, but that it was able to move at all as this cartouche, I hope, suggests. For the army was more used to operating on the plains of India than in the hills. The British force was opposed by a Gurkha army of only some 12,000. But the Gurkhas proved to be resolute soldiers, adept at building strong stockades and force, forts that dominated the passes through the hills around which they moved with great alacrity. The British force advanced simultaneously into the hills, two columns in the east and two in the west. The quality of British generalship was mixed. The Bengal army largely inadequate for the challenge. The Gurkhas put up a tough fight and drove back three of the four columns. In the east, General Marley deserted the field. General Wood ambled indecisively. No sense of urgency pervaded their campaigns. In the west, General Rollo Gillespie, with Lieutenant Frederick Young in his column, was killed, leading an assault on one of the well-built Gurkha forts at Kalunga. He died at Young's side, and the assault stalled. Only in the far west did the column of General David Octoloni, the arch company Nabob, possessor of 15 Indian wives, decisive, audacious, energetic. <laughs> Only he achieved his objectives. The Gurkha general Amar Singh sued for terms. These were rejected and the British launched another campaign in the east, again under the able Octoloni. And this time the Gurkhas capitulated to avoid the occupation of Kathmandu. After two years the war was over and under the Treaty of Sagoli, signed in the field by both sides, Nepal was confined sovereign and independent still to its original boundaries but promising peace and eternal friendship. The Gurkha's tenacious fighting skills had impressed the British and particularly Octoloni. He and Frederick Young proposed a call for British service and three irregular Gurkha units were raised. One of these, the Samor Battalion, so called from the name of the province in which it was raised, was drawn from Gurkha prisoners by Frederick Young. 
Give me the authority, he wrote to Optolene, to release our prisoners and tell them they are free men. I undertake to raise a body of soldiers who will not disgrace you or the country or myself. In later reports, Young wrote that although the Gurkhas were Hindus, they were not fastidious. They are loyally attached to British service, to whom they look for protection. In their contunements, they are orderly and well behaved, and on service, active, vigilant, and bold. Characteristics that pertain to this day. Gradually, the Sabor Battalion began to build a reputation with battle honours won at Bhurtpur and during the Sikh wars at Aliwal and Sabran. In 1857 came the East India Company's greatest challenge. Largely undetected and unacknowledged, a long period of sedition had been simmering in the Bengal army. The company's other two armies of Bombay and Madras were largely unaffected. But in the Bengal army, neutral respect between British officers and their high caste Indian sepoys had begun to break down. Race, religion and military incompetence all played their part. The final catalyst had been the cartridges for the new Enfield rifles, greased with pig or cow tallow. The pig unclean to Muslims, the cow sacred to Hindus, and the sepoys refused to handle them. The Gurkhas had no such reservations. On the 11th of May, the mutiny exploded. The Bengal army deserted in droves, its former glory lost. The British were besieged and massacred in a score of cities, and their grip on the whole of northern India lay in the balance. The particular focus for the mutineers was Delhi, fortress of the Mughal emperors, with the last of them, Shah Zafar, sat reading his poetry in his gilded palace. Etched on the entrance arch to his audience chamber, Shah Jahan's now somewhat ironic inscription, if there is paradise on earth, it is here, it is here. And it was largely to hear that the mutinous regiment, under command of their native officers, marched with their British colours flying and their bands playing British airs. For the Samo Battalion, the call to arms, their military rite of passage, came three days later with orders to march from their lines in Dehradun to Delhi, 200 miles to the south. Major Reed and his battalion of some 500 men immediately set off to assist the British suppress the mutiny. The key defensive position and the main picket on the ridge above the walled city centred on Hindu Rao's house and was to be occupied without relief throughout that baking hot summer by the Sabo Battalion and the British 60th Rifles. In the walled city below, 30,000 mutineers were assembled. As soon as Reed and his Gurkhas were on the ridge, the mutineers came out of the city to assault their position. It was the first of 26 attacks that the Gurkhas repulsed between June and September as they tenaciously stood their ground. And by the time the engineers had blown the Kashmir Gate and the British had retaken the city amidst scenes of terrible carnage, the mutiny was mortally struck. The Samor Battalion had suffered 327 casualties, only one of its nine British officers emerging unscathed. But the praise for the battalion's performance was widespread. Hindu Rao's house was riddled through with shot and shell as this early photograph of Reed's survivors shows. The impact of the mutiny was profound for the British in India and its army. 
the East India Company was abolished and the British Crown, under a Viceroy, took direct control of India. A new army was built in place of the old. For the Gurkhas, the rewards for their fidelity was to be raised from the ruck of the sepoy battalions and appointed rifle regiments. The Sambor Battalion became the second Gurkhas and adopted the rifle style and the red facings of their friends in the 60th Rifles. Sartorial customs retained to this day. Their value recognized, more Gurkha rifle regiments were raised until by 1908 they were an elite corps within the Indian Army of 10 rifle regiments, each of two battalions. 50 years on from the mutiny, the Sabal rifle veterans of the Ridge reassembled in Delhi for the King Emperor's Durban. Aside from the mutiny and the two world wars, there were to be many other campaigns for the Gurkhas in India with names long lost in the mists of an imperial past. But for the most part, campaigning was dominated by Afghanistan and the northwest frontier. That great bulwark guarding the gates of India, the potential route for a Russian invasion. The potential vulnerability of this wild mountainous region linking Central and Southern Asia loomed large in a British imagination, repeatedly scenting danger. The campaigns themselves were costly and vicious. The disastrous First Afghan War of 1839 had underlined the dangers of getting involved militarily in that difficult land. Assistant Surgeon William Brighton, arriving in Jalalabad, the sole survivor of the infamous retreat by 17,000 souls. As always, easier to enter Afghanistan than to leave it. The Second War of 1879 was initiated by a refusal of the Afghans to receive a British envoy, having admitted a Russian mission. The British response was war. One of the three large military columns involved was commanded by General Frederick Roberts, VC. And during that war, three Gurkha regiments took part in Roberts' famous 300-mile march in 20 days from Kabul to Kandahar in blazing heat to raise the Afghan siege of the garrison. I sense this picture depicts the start of the march rather than the end. And in the final battle of the war at Kandahar, a second Gurkha rifleman, Indabel Lama, captured an Afghan gun, reputedly crying out as he did so, this gun belongs to my regiment, second Gorkas, Prince of Wales's. He then thrust his cap down its muzzle to ensure ownership. Well, believe that if you will, but the gun itself now stands outside the Royal Gurkha Rifles guardroom at Shortcliffe. The Second Afghan War's political objectives remained elusive and at a cost of 50,000 British and Indian casualties, many dying from cholera and dysentery. Fighting in Afghanistan can be an unforgiving business. Between the Afghan wars, campaigning on the frontier continued. The army against the Pathan tribes Semitic in origin, Muslim in religion, pushed to in speech. The Masood, the Afridi, the Waziri. The tribesmen were continually on the rampage into the plains or raising jihads. The frontier always had a certain romantic and legendary appeal in the wild grandeur of its mountains. The 50 mile long Khyber Pass the shadowy intrigue of British and Russian espionage, young husband and the great game. Today it has lost none of its potency. Here was a strip of wild mountain territory in which the law was not administered, where every man was armed, who accepted no master and gave no quarter. 
physically tireless, natural tacticians with an ability to strike hard and fast if their enemy dropped their guard, and ruthless with prisoners. Save one round for yourself, was the traditional advice. Regiments marching to the frontier would move with an advance guard to mount pickets on the high ground to their flanks. Hazardous operations in themselves, where the slightest neglect of precautions or lack of alertness would invite the remote, proud and independent Pathan to a murderous dash, the seizure of valuable weapons, and then to melt away. Given their obvious talent for mounted warfare and physical robustness, the Gurkhas would always be intimately involved on the frontier, for they excelled at scouting, sniping, rapidly descending or ascending the mountain sides and fighting the unruly, culling and unforgiving tribesmen. Perhaps this picture of four light-hearted Gurkhas on the frontier of the 1930s will give a feel for their unique military style and light-hearted insouciance. And with insouciance in mind, I recall on operations a Gurkha orderly waking his company commander at night with a dreadful shake to the shoulder and announcing softly as if a family butler announcing an uninvited guest. Saab, the enemy has arrived. <laughs> but all this on the fringes of empire would historically take second place to Gurkha operations in two world wars. In the Great War, six Gurkha regiments were part of the Indian Corps sent in 1914 to reinforce the British Expeditionary Force. It was their first deployment on European soil, and like so many on the Western Front, their first exposure to the horrors of the trenches for which they were ill-prepared. Their initial experience in the line south of Ypres was sobering, with heavy casualties from shelling and abortive attacks. But in March 1915, 50, the second and third Gurkhas were part of some success for the Indian Corps, briefly capturing the village of Nerve Chapelle, the first time in the war that the German line had been breached. And later on, there was a significant incident at the Battle of Luz, where Rifleman Kulbert Tarpa became the first Gurkha to win the Victoria Cross. Prior to the Great War, British officers from Gurkha regiments had been awarded nine crosses, but until 1911, soldiers of the Indian Army, for major acts of gallantry, were awarded the Indian Order of Merit. The Great War changed this. Rifleman Colbert, one of the wounded survivors of an abortive wire-cutting party, acting with the most unselfish courage, saved the lives of three other wounded soldiers, two Gurkhas and a Leicester, by carrying them on his back one at a time across no man's land to Allied lines, all the while under fire. Later, stalemate on the Western Front led to the ill-fated amphibious expedition at Gallipoli, where three Gurkha battalions formed part of General Hamilton's force. History naturally focuses on the major contribution of the Anzac troop, but Gurkhas too had a significant role. The first six Gurkhas were ordered to capture Sari Bear Ridge, which overlooked the Straits of the Dardanelles, a key Turkish position. And in a famous feat of arms, they uniquely in the campaign reached the top, and the Turks ran. But the Gurkhas were in a parlous position. All the British officers, with the exception of the doctor, had been killed or wounded. There were no communications, and expected reinforcements failed to arrive. They were shelled by their own side. The Turks counterattacked, and the Gurkhas, now superbly led by their senior Gurkha officer, were forced to withdraw. A reverse by the narrowest of margins. But there was at least one fortunate outcome. 
While attacking up the ridge, the six Gurkhas were watched from below by a wounded officer of the Royal Warwicks. Impressed by what he saw of the Gurkha attack, he changed regiments and joined the six Gurkhas. His name was Bill Slim. In the Second, war, in the Second World War, a revived and well-prepared Indian army was to reach its highest point of efficiency. The 10 Gurkha regiments recruited an additional 32 battalions, including two parachute units. And the task of training and equipping and leading these units with success was an immense challenge. 27 Gurkha battalions campaigned in Burma, a huge country of harsh terrain with a debilitating climate and much disease. Of evocative names, Irrawaddy and the Arakan, the lilting syllables of Mandalay. A rampant Japanese army, the fall of Rangoon, the arduous 800 mile retreat to the borders of India, to Imphal and Kohima. The long range penetration by the controversial Old Wingate Chindits, 40% of whom were Gurkhas, and then the battles in the Arakan before Slim's offensive eventually turned defeat into victory. The Gurkha soldier played a significant part of all of this. The fighting was grim and personal against a fanatical enemy. Nine Victoria Crosses were awarded to officers and men of the Gurkha regiments in Burma, who lost 2,600 men killed in action, including 113 of their British officers. One of those crosses was while in an attack in the Arakan by Rifleman Banbakta Gurung of my regiment's 3rd Battalion. In the course of the Battle of Tamandu, an angry Banbakta showing a gross disregard for his own safety, courageously and individually cleared five heavily defended Japanese bunkers, one after the other, using his rifle, his grenades, his bayonet, his cookery, and eventually rocks, an action that was decisive in capturing his company's objective. Years later, this indomitable Years later, this indomitable soldier visited my battalion in Hong Kong and I photographed him with his three sons, all serving proudly in their father's regiment. Outside of Burma, Gurkha battalion served with particular distinction in North Africa and Italy. My first battalion was part of the 4th Indian Division, division commanded by one of its former officers, General Francis Tuka during the North African battles of El Alamein, Wadi Akarit, and Tunis. At Wadi Akarit, where the Axis forces had established themselves in the aftermath of El Alamein, the battalion performed with great panache. The high feature of Fat Nasa was thought by both sides to be impossible. But Tuka, confident of his old battalion's mounted warfare skills, decided it should be attempted. And following a three-mile night approach march, Subhadar Lal Bahadur's platoon led the 1st Battalion night attack over difficult terrain and under much German shell fire. Only the Subhadar and two of his men survived this bitter engagement in securing their objective with rifle, pistol, cookery, and bayonet. And two hours before Montgomery's main attack was to go in, the Gurkhas had seized the key point of the enemy's defensive line, and the way to Tunis was open. Montgomery recorded in his diary, we had on this day the heaviest and most savage fighting since I commanded the 8th Army. My troops fought magnificently, especially the 4th Indian Division. Later that year, Lal Bahana came to England and was presented with his cross by King George VI in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. The battalion then moved on up the spine of Italy, battling hard 
to experience the prolonged horrors of the battle for Monte Cassino, where, as one Gurkha officer described it, even the brave faltered. By the end of the war, the Gurkha regiments, with some 90 battle honours, had, with many others, proved to be more than the equal of Rommel's Africa Corps and the Imperial Japanese Army. In the aftermath of that war came a huge historical shift, the independence of India and with it an uncertain future for the Gurkha regiments. It was an unhappy time for officers and men. Regiments were scattered round Asia, armies were demobilizing, India in the midst of partition was in turmoil with widespread intercommunal violence. After much uncertainty, it was decided that four Gurkha regiments would transfer to the British Army in Malaya. The remaining six would stay with the Indians. Men in regiments selected for British service could opt to stay with them, move to a regiment remaining in India, or return to the hills of Nepal. The choices were difficult, with much unknown and loyalties severely tested. In due course, a tripartite agreement with India, Nepal and the UK laid down agreed terms of Gurkha service in the two armies, including their pay and pensions. At the close of 1947, my regiment, with much anguish, left Dehradun, its home for 131 years, and where so much earlier it had set off for the ridge of Delhi, and together with three other regiments, set sail for Malaya and the British Army. I spoke earlier of the Malayan campaign that was to occupy the newly arrived regiments until 1960, and further operations came shortly after that. Seizing on po possible wider unrest following an externally inspired rebellion in the British protectorate of Brunei, an expan in 1962, an expansionist President Sukarno of Indonesia began an opportunistic terrorist campaign on the island of Borneo across the thousand mile Indonesian border with Sarawak and Sabah, now part of wider Malaysia. Most of it dense tropical rainforest and largely unmapped. Indonesia's regular army marine and parachute units in particular, many trained by the British Dug and Warfare School, were leading infiltration parties across the border, attacking police and military posts. To the north, in Malaya, two advanced companies of Indonesian paratroops dropped into Labi, where they were severely dealt with at some cost by the 10th Gurkha Rifles. Along the border, 14 British and Gurkha battalions were deployed, initially on the defensive, suffering attacks while protecting key points and patrolling the deep jungle and river lines close to the border, seeking to identify incursions. In charge of operations was an experienced and resolute Gurkha general, Walter Walker. In the face of a growing number of attacks forcing the British onto the back foot, in 1964 the General obtained government agreement for selected units to operate secretly and deniably inside Indonesian Borneo with the aim of blunting Sukarno's campaign. In that same year, as a young and still rather green lieutenant, I was given command of a rifle company of 110 Gurkhas, and with them I took part in several of these clandestine cross-border operations, either to carry out reconnaissance, ambush Indonesian lines of communication, or attack their bases. These operations, if not on the scale of the Chindits, were still somewhat hazardous, often outside the range of our artillery and helicopter support across the border for the evacuation of casualties was forbidden. 
Crossing the border produced a certain palpable apprehension at first, but we trained hard, and I recall looking back how stalwart the Gurkha soldier was in this jungle environment. Individual operations could last a week or more. All our requirements, weapons, ammunition, rations, radios, had to be carried on our backs. I admired how strong and uncomplaining the soldiers were. Many riflemen, particularly machine gunners, carried more than their body weight across the most difficult country, covered in mud and leeches for several days at a time. And when surprise was so much the key to success, they were able to move relatively silently for days on end. They seemed to have a natural ability to move in this environment and were able to detect the smallest signs of enemy movement. And when enemy contact was made, they were resolute and effective in reading the ground and deploying their firepower. I quickly learned that few well-laid plans survive contact with the enemy, and which Gurkha officers and NCOs were the most reliable, and that parade ground excellence was not always the best guide to battle efficiency. I now understood at first hand the military characteristics which had stood the Gurkha in such good stead over so many years and was grateful for them. Old men forget much, but I can remember so well to this day the names and faces of all the Gurkhas that went with me on those operations. With the successful ending of the campaign in 1966, came British withdrawal from the Far East, less Brunei and Hong Kong, and severe reductions to the Gurkhas. Over the course of the next few years, the brigade was cut in half. 7,000 Gurkhas were made redundant, and four battalions disappeared from the orbit. 80 British officers left or were transferred to British battalions. There was another difficult and testing time. There was some excitement in Hong Kong, which had a largely Gurkha garrison, when the excesses of Mao's cultural revolution produced pressure on the border and spilled over onto Hong Kong streets with some severe rioting. The sight of my soldiers in their distinctive Gurkha hats, acting in support of the police and with admirable restraint, on the streets of Kowloon after nights of mayhem, quickly encouraged the crowds to disperse without a shot being fired. And close and constant watch was kept on the Chinese border, the garrison always ready to provide a measured response to Chinese pressure in the lead up to the handover in 1997. One battalion in turn served in the United Kingdom and this allowed the Gurkha to start a closer integration with the rest of the British Army. In 1982, these seventh Gurkhas were selected along with the Marines, the Guards and the Parachute Regiment to constitute the force to recapture the Falkland Islands. As I recall at the time, while serving in the Ministry of Defence, the Foreign Office seemed nervous of deploying a Gurkha battalion but the Chief of the General Staff went straight to Prime Minister Thatcher to ask her if she had any objection to sending one Gurkha battalion with the force. Only one was her positive reply. And in the 90s came more cuts to the brigade as the army's strength was forced to reduce further. And as the brigade's Major General, as well as the British Force Commander in Hong Kong, I had to fight hard for the survival of a meaningful Gurkha force while retaining morale. We were to lose at least half our strength again. The rest of the British infantry were prejudiced against us as they too faced cuts. And together with my successors and the brigade staff, we, we put together a force of a single regiment, the Royal Gurkha Rifles of two battalions, combining all the old four regiments into one 
while also retaining sterling regiments of Gurkha engineers, signalers, and logistics as an integral part of the British Army, with the same terms and conditions of service as everyone else, and the right of settlement in the United Kingdom for those serving into the 21st century. All would be entitled to serve for at least 12 years, thus avoiding the churn and retraining that the rest of the British infantry face, with many of their soldiers leaving after three. The Gurkha thus providing cost-effective service. This formula and the need to garrison Hong Kong until the handover in 97 satisfied ministers of the army. And then fine operational service in the Balkans, in Kosovo and Bosnia, in East Timor, in Sierra Leone, in two Gulf Wars, and particularly in Afghanistan, proved to any doubters that the Gurkhas could more than develop and handle any of the physical and technical challenges of technical sol soldiering in the British Army. Mystique is no substitute for military competence. Today the Gurkha is better educated, he speaks very good English, he's perhaps more self-confident and less deferential, more ambitious and assertive than when I joined all those years ago. But they retain their cultural identity and those Gurkha characteristics as riflemen, disciplined, agile and quick with a lightness of touch that has served them and us so well. They have not lost their charm. For 250 places a year, 8,000 boys register for possible enlistment. Today, one battalion is stationed in Brunei as the Army's Far East Reserve, and the second is stationed in the UK, and with the Parachute Regiment, serves as part of the Rapid Reaction Air Assault Brigade, many parachute trained, and wearing the red berry. They are currently on operational duties in Corbel. There are Gurkhas in the SAS and similar organisations. The brief story I have told was set upon its course 200 years ago by a remarkable set of East India Company servants, not least David Octolone and Frederick Young. They had recognised during that most demanding of all tests of character, battle, that the Gurkha soldier with his courage, resilience, good humour and discipline had something special to offer as soldiers of the crown. The Gurkhas themselves, today and yesterday, repaid that confidence by becoming a most consummate fighting force a remarkable endeavour. These Gurkhas are Rifleman Dhamma Bahada, a 90-year-old welfare pension veteran from the Burma campaign, and Sergeant Dip Passard, still serving in the Royal Gurkha Rifles, who won a conspicuous gallantry cross for single-handedly beating off an attack by 30 Taliban on his Afghanistan post. But Gurkha service does not need patronising rhetoric or subjective regimental histories to emphasise the qualities of their service. Of course there have been setbacks, the odd trough amongst the peaks, the occasional wobble. Not every Gurkha was brave all the time. Not every battle was won. These are not crookery-wielding supermen as sometimes the tabloid press would have them, psychologically useful as that occasionally might be. Delightful as they are to serve with, not all are military paragons, and sometimes, as soldiers do, a Gurkha lands himself in trouble. But these occasions are rare, and the overall integrity of their record the sustained quality of their military service stands the closest scrutiny and bears comparison, I suggest, with any other group of fighting men. Even the occasional academic, distrustful of military histories as I am, seem to accept that. It is a unique story, 
And what is so remarkable is that these men born in a foreign land whose homes are not threatened by invasion, to whom the cause for which they are fighting may sometimes be remote, whose committed and very carefully selected British officers are of different faith, speak a different language, look physically different, should combine and bond together with the deepest respect and affection for each other to serve the Crown with such effectiveness. It explains nothing to say that they are simply mercenaries, which in terms of UN protocols they certainly are not and are never referred to as such. Men on occasions may flock to the colours for pay, but it cannot simply only be for money that the Gurkha rifle regiments, with their sworn allegiance to the Crown, have won over a hundred battle honours, earned 26 Victoria Crosses, sustained great hardship, or given their lives for this country in their thousands. I suggest it's a very remarkable story. Thank you very much.